We're going to resume. resume the recording. Okay. So um, some of you on here know who I am. Some of you don't. Uh, my name is Drew. Um, I've been with our agency at American Income for, you know, five and a half years now. I've been with Tommy the whole time. Um, today, you know, what we're going to be going over is all of the no cost benefits that are associated with our company. Okay. I want to get one thing out to you guys. First and foremost, do not be a no cost delivery person. What I mean by that is there's not really any money in the no cost benefits. You're not going to make any money by dropping off child safety kits to people, you know, or, or just going over discount cards, right? The no cost benefits are there for a reason. The number one reason is because it, it builds up our company. It makes us look good. We're giving our members other things that other companies don't give them, right? The other reason we do it is to dig for some information on our families so that we can use it later down the road in the in the actual presentation, right? So I also want you to keep in mind that not every single family is going to have the same no cost benefits. When you're sitting down with a union member, they get access to, you know, all of them except for the will kit, right? So they get the child safety kits, they get the AIL plus card, they get the family information guide, they get their AD and D certificate, and they also get their, their needs analysis, right? So in reality, there's sometimes there's five no cost benefits, right? You know, now if you're in a child safe, you know, you'll probably just go over the child safe, the family information guide, the AIL plus card, and then the needs analysis, right? Will kit, kind of the same thing, except for you put the will kit in there um, as well, you know? So what we're going to do in training here is I'm going to break down each one of the no cost benefits, how it's explained, why it's important, how to collect referrals off of it. Right. And I'm going to walk you through basically all of the no cost benefits, except for the needs analysis. Um, that's going to be covered a little bit later in training. Okay. So as you can see on the board, no cost benefits, right? Now I have number, one, two, and three here, right? Every one of these no cost benefits, you need to do these three things in here to make it a successful presentation for that benefit, okay? The first thing you always wanna do is you wanna build up the importance on why they need it. Right, build up the importance of that benefit. The second thing you gotta do is give them a quick explanation on how it works. Not only how the program works, but how it affects them. I don't know if it's an A or an E affects A because it happens to them, right? Um, <laughs> uh, and then the third thing you're going to do is collect referrals. Right? That's the most important thing. But the third thing doesn't happen if you don't do the first two really well. Right? So the first no cost benefit that I usually go over with them, and I know every MGA team is a little bit different on which ones they go over first, but my reasoning behind why we go, I go from the child safe to the AIL plus card to the family information guide, then to their AD and D certificate is because I go from least intrusive information to most intrusive information right? Least about life insurance to most about life insurance. It's a smooth transition from that point, right? And if you think about it, when you're sitting down with these union members, they know that they have this no cost accidental policy there. That's what they're looking for, right? That's what they want to do. They want to go over that no cost policy, right? 
Now, I don't know if you guys have ever been to like Dave and Buster's with some little kids, right? But they have a favorite game that they play there. As soon as they go there, they go to that game right immediately, right? And they play that game a lot. Once they get done tired of that game, they're tired of the whole Dave and Buster's though, right? It works the same way in the presentation. We want to save that for a little bit and at the end, right? If you get right into their, their AD and D certificate, they're going to be like, what, what the hell the rest of this meeting's about? No, you kind of want to delay it a little bit for them. That's my thinking going into it, right? Everyone does it a little bit different, right? But if you do it that way, it's a smoother transition into actually talking about and going over life insurance, right? Now, the first thing that you do when you're going over the no cost benefits is you kind of put the pressure on the system, not on you. What I mean by that is saying words like what they had set up for you. The first benefit that your union had set up for you was the next benefit that they have set up for you. Right. I don't say the next benefit I'm going to go over. Right. What they have set up for you. Those are the words. Right. So the first benefit that, that, we, that we always have set up for our members is the child safety kits, right? And I'm actually gonna pop it up on the screen because you guys are all virtual so you can all see it. Um, so this, and pull the PowerPoint up for you. Um, boom. All right, so not now, just opening it. Let's give it a second here, but Either way, this is what the child safety gets look like when they come out to them. You can see that they're folded in threes. It comes in a plastic bag. And then inside the bag itself, when you pull it out, there is a, you know, a police grade ink strip in there. It comes with an ink strip. And it looks the same thing as we have on the PowerPoint. Except in the PowerPoint, one side looks like this. And then the other side looks like this, right? So when they actually get this sent, they actually get the physical copy of it in a plastic bag so they can keep it nice and neat. Now, the first thing I go over with them in the PowerPoint, and I'm gonna to try to share this with you guys and see if it'll work here. Give me this, screen share, PowerPoint, okay. Blow it up a little bit bigger, go to this page there. All right, can you guys see that there? Yeah. Okay. So. What I would say is I'd say, now Mary and Joe, the first benefit that they had set up for you guys was your child safe ID kits. Now, usually what I say is, I'm sure you know some people with kids, right? And they're like, yeah, I know some people with kids. Okay, great. Well, you're gonna love this first benefit they have set up for you. It's actually endorsed by the police and teachers unions, right? So what I'm doing first here is I'm building up the importance of it. First off, I'm asking, I'm, I'm sure you guys know some people with kids, right? Because at the end, when I'm asking for referrals, they can't tell me, no, they don't know anybody with kids because they just told me they did, right? So the reason why we designed this kit is because just alone last year, 450,000 children went missing or got abducted. Crazy stat. What's even crazier is the FBI did a study and they figured that if those kids don't come home in the first 24 hours of being missing, 93% of the time, they don't come home at all. That's a crazy stat right there. You have 24 hours to find your kid or they don't come home, right? Now, why this was really designed is because it takes the sharpest parent or grandparent anywhere from four to six hours to give the police everything that's involved in this kit. Because if something happens, the parents aren't thinking about height, weight, eye color, hair color. They're thinking, oh my God, where are my kids at? Who are they with? If they're old enough, why aren't they answering their cell phone? They're panicking, right? Now, I don't know if any of you guys on here are parents, right? But if you are, use those personal experiences that you had as a parent to tell them about this. I'm sure if you are a parent, there's been a time in your life where you've been at the grocery store, you look down to take, take your wallet out of, out of your purse and pay the, the, for whatever you're buying. That took 30 seconds to a minute to do that. At that same time, your kid wanders off, right? And they're, they're, they might only be in the next aisle over or you know, two cashiers over, 
But at that point, you're not thinking. You're like, oh my God, where's my kid at? You're freaking out. You're doing all the wrong things. You're panicking. That one minute might have felt like a whole hour for you. That's why this is designed. So if something, God forbid, like that does happen, you have it in your purse. All you got to do is give it to the security and they'll lock down that store and they'll find that kid immediately. Right? So it's not always that, that this goes to the police. You know, there was, I'll give you a good example. You know, back in Pittsburgh a couple years ago, there was, there's a mall called Westmoreland Mall. And, um, you know, there was a, 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 basically a child abduction that went down there. Same, same exact thing. You know, a woman was paying for something, took her, her purse, took her wallet out of her purse, paid, went to go put her, wa her wallet back in her purse. Her kid, her daughter was gone, right? She actually had one of these kits on her. She gave it to the, to the authorities that were in the mall. They locked the mall down, right? They ended up finding her daughter, you know, 10, 10 to 20 minutes later in a bathroom in the mall. She was dressed in different clothing. She had a hat on her head right? There was nothing that, that said that this was the kid other than a birthmark on her cheek. And the, and the mother mark, marked the birthmark on here, right? So there is real world applications for this stuff, guys, you know, especially if it's happened to you in the past. I know I was a badass kid when I was a kid. My mom, went, and I grew up with five other, five other brothers. So imagine my mom walking around the grocery store with five of us hanging on the cart. You think we were always next to the cart? Hell no. Right? We are causing mischief throughout the store. The first thing we used to do in apartment stores is we used to play hide and seek in those clothing, clothing racks. Right? Imagine how terrified my mom was. So, and this was before cell phones. This was before having a picture right, right on her phone that she could you know, say that that's my kid. So we're building up the importance here. We're making it important to them. Right? You can even throw another stat in here. You can ask them a question here. I'd like to get my families involved in this situation. I would ask them, now, Mary and Joe, you know, since 450,000 children go missing or abducted every year, where do you think Illinois ranks for, for child abductions? Right, they'll give you some number. Illinois ranks number nine for worst places for child abductions. Number nine. Not good, right? Um, so what, what this actually does is it, like I said, it saves the parents time because if that kid, like studies show that if a kid is gone every mile away from the house or every minute that they're away from the house is a mile further that they could be right. And if you're in Chicago, if something happens to the kid in Chicago, they could be in three different States in two hours, super easily. They could be down in Indiana, they could be over to Michigan or up in Wisconsin in two hours. So these do have real world applications, guys. Once I, once I explain how important it is to them, and I, I even get into that, like I'm sure, has it ever happened to you, Mary, where you, know, you, you, were, you were actually with your kid and went to go pay and then they ran off, right? I, chances are it's happened. Chances are if you have kids, it's happened, you know? So include yourself with that, you know? Once I give them those stats, the next thing I do is I show them how it works. I give them a quick explanation on how it works and how it affects them. First thing I do is I say, Mary and Joe, this is what your child safety kit looks like here. Um, what, what's one of your kids' names, for example? I get the kid's name right off the bat. And they would tell me, oh, his name is Matt. Okay, great. What you're going to do is you're going to put Matt on the front where it says child's name right here, right? And then you're going to put the date it's completed on right below it. Now on the inside is actually where all of the good information is going to go. So number one would be personal information. Anything that's going to change about Matt, like his height, his weight, his eye color, hair color, you're going to put that in pencil. That way you can change it and erase it down the road. Anything that's going to stay the same, like the birth date, the social, the name, put that stuff in pen. Number two is a physical description of Matt. Anything that makes him unique, glasses, braces, scars, birthmarks, anything like that, you mark it on a little character over to the right, and you write a little description to the left of it. Now, number three is the DNA sample. So 
The police do not want spit or blood there. What they do want is a hair follicle or fingernails, right? So I would say to Mary and Joe, Mary and Joe, I'm sure Matt's never bad, right? He's, a, he's an angel. And they would go, yeah, he's never bad. They always give you like a sarcastic laugh at that point, guys. I'm telling you, throw that in there. I'm sure Matt's never bad, right? Get him to interact with you at this point. They'll be like, yeah, he's never bad. I'm like, yeah, I know. He's probably bad about twice a year, right? And they'll go, yeah, he probably acts up a little bit. Well, next time Matt's being bad, instead of grabbing his whole head of hair, right, just pluck one or two hairs out and then tape it down there uh, for, for DNA. And then they'll laugh. Right? You already got them involved. They like you. Now, I know a lot of kids nowadays have very short hair. So at that point, you're going to use fingernails. It's tough to grab out hair. All right. Now, the hair cannot be cut. It has to be pulled from the root. It has to have the little DNA strand on the bottom of it. it. When it comes out of your head, that's where the DNA is. Right? And that will actually hold and preserve for about six months. After about six months, it needs to be replaced. Okay. Number four would be where we put Matt's fingerprints. Now, I want to, I always warn my parents. I say, I want to warn you guys. This ink is permanent police grade ink. It is non-toxic. It'll never harm Matt, but it is extremely messy. What I mean by that is if you get this on your table, your clothes, the floor, the couches, the walls, it will stay there. If you get it on their skin, it'll come right off with soap and water. So my suggestion to you as parents is to do this either outside when it's nice on the porch or do it right before bath time, get them all 10 fingerprints on there, toss them right in the tub, right? This is permanent ink, guys. I don't want you to test this because it will stain things. My brother, who, God rest his soul, thought that it was a joke that it was permanent and took this ink. This was like three, four years ago. Took the ink and put it on the middle of his table. And he said, watch, I'll get it off. He tried scrubbing it, couldn't get it off, right? That mark is still on that table three years later. Now, my... my my brother's wife is very savvy and she's, uh, she's pretty good at decorating. So she has a big table runner that goes across it. You can't even see it, right? But I know it's there and I've seen it. Last time at Christmas, we were over at her house and I said, hey, let me check if that mark's still there. And it's still there, right? So it is very permanent ink. Once I get done one through four, I ask them, I tie it down. Now, Mary and Joe, do you have any questions on the inside? Can you see why all this information is very important to have down? And they'll go, yes. Right, you always wanna frame your questions to where they can only really answer yes. Can you see why it's important to have this for your child? And they'll say, yes. Okay, great. Now, the last part is on the last, you know, the, the previous slide there would be number five. That would, be, that would be where you put a photo of the child, right? Now, the best photos are usually school photos because it's a headshot, it's an HD, and it's just the kid. What I tell my parents, I say usually, you know, that what they recommend is a school photo. Um, I'm sure you got a million photos lying around. You're going to get a million more down the road. All you got to do is cut one out every six to eight months and tape it down there. Pretty simple. In the middle section there, I kind of go over, it depends on the age of the kids, really. If you're dealing with a new parent who has two kids that are under three, um, I go over the middle section there just to make sure that they know, um, you know, stranger danger, teaching kids how to call 911. The biggest one on there is number three. It's not putting any kind of uh, name on a backpack or a lunchbox or a jacket or anything like that. That's a really big one because sometimes the teachers tell the parents to do that, write their kid's name on the backpack. Um, that's not the brightest thing to do, to be honest with you, because all it takes is one creepy individual to wait after school for that kid and to say, hey, Jimmy, you know, your mom told me to come pick you up. She's not going to be able to pick you up from school today. She sent me to pick you up. Come on and hop in the van real quick. The kid's like, oh, he knows my name. He must know my mom. 
No, he just looked at your backpack and your name's on it. Right? So it's very small stuff like that that people are using. And the only reason, the only time I really mention that is that they have some young kids. If they have older kids, they've raised them. They know how to call 911. They know about stranger danger, that type of thing. Right? But once I get ex done explaining the whole kit to them, I, and once again, I ask them, now, guys, again, do you have any questions on how your child safety kits work? One question they might ask here, and they'll say, uh, you know, when, when I fill this out, who do I send this to? Actually, you keep it with you at all times. You know, keep it in your purse. Uh, if you're traveling, keep it in the glove box of your car. If you're going to keep it at the house, we suggest you keep it in either a fireproof safe where all the other important papers are, or you keep it in the freezer. And you might be like, Drew, why keep it in the freezer? Well, three reasons. Number one, the, when DNA is frozen, it keeps it preserved a little bit longer, right? You've all seen cold case files where DNA gets preserved for two years because it's frozen under ice, right? The second reason is because if God forbid that house burns down, something happens to the house, the freezer and the fridge are usually still there. I don't know what the hell they're made of, but they're usually still there. And then the third reason is a little kind of like a little joke, but it has serious tones to it. I usually say, now the third reason why we have you keep it in there is because, you know, if, if Ben and Jerry's are your good friends like they are mine, and you're in the freezer every single day, you're going to realize that the kits are right there on the door. It's just recognition, daily recognition. Like how many times do you guys go into the fridge or freezer every single day? Quite a lot, right? So if you go into the fridge or freezer and you see that that child safety kit's sitting there right next to the ice maker, and you see it every single day, if something happens, you're like, oh, I know exactly where that's at, and you grab it real quick, right? So if they ask me where I keep it at, that's kind of where I would tell them. Um, but typically, if you explain it very thoroughly like that with them and make sure that you ask the question, do you have any questions on how this works? You know, you should be okay with explaining that to them. It's pretty easy to go through with them. Now, I want you guys to realize something I did there that's very subtle is I used their kid's name over and over and over and over again, right? What I did was I included their kid in it. I made sure it, it affected them. I used their kid's name, right? Use of names is a big thing. They should almost get tired of their name, you saying it so many times. But now do you guys have any questions on explaining the child safety kits or walking them through it or going over the stats in the beginning of it? Nope. All right, beautiful. So remember the last thing though we gotta do, we gotta collect referrals. Now you're gonna get a bulk of your referrals right from the child safety kits. And to be honest with you, I think these are some of the best referrals that we get because number one, these are usually younger families with kids. What that also means is that they're usually healthy, they're insurable. And the third thing that it means is that they probably haven't planned for life insurance before. They probably haven't sat down and talked to anybody about life insurance before. They've never had the opportunity, right? So you're getting a young couple with insurable interest. Can't beat that, can't beat that. Right now, in order to get the child safe referrals, there's a little bit of psychology behind it. The first piece of psychology is getting them to get their phone in their hands. Right? Why? Because if I asked you to tell me the number of your best friend, could you do that off the top of your head? Probably not, right? But all you have to do is go in your phone and, and look at their name and click their name and it'll call them, right? So what I'm getting at is most people don't know numbers off the top of their head. They have to go into the phone. So the first thing we got to do is get the phone in their hands, right? So this is a little bit of control here, right? He who has control wins. This is another little small part where you're going to get control from them. You're going to say, Mary and Joe, last thing is I have some very important information for you to put into your phone. 
So what I need you to do, I need you to go ahead and, oh, excuse me, and open up a brand new contact in your phone and save it as child safe ID kits or child safe kits. And I'm gonna give you this number. It's 1-800-742-6783. And you're gonna save that number in your phone in case you lose these kits, in case you damage them, even or if you have more kids down the road, you can always give that phone number a call and they'll send more kits out to you for free. All right? And they'll go, okay, great, that's awesome. And so you got the number saved in your phone? They're like, yes, I do. I'm like, perfect. So this is actually where the police and firefighters, this is where they ask for your help, right? They're not asking for any monetary donations. So you don't have to worry about that, all right? But what they are asking though, is that you do your part in the community by sponsoring a minimum of 10 of your closest family members or friends to receive their kits as well, right? Most people start with their family. They get their family protected. So I know that you told me that your brother lives two blocks away from you and he has some little kids as well. Let's start with him. Does he have a 773 number or a 312 number, right? What I want you guys to realize in that aspect is that no one is really just going to open up their phone book and give you 10 names right then and there because you said, I need 10 names. You got to take the low hanging fruit. You got to, you got to take the person that they talked about in the rapport building and use that as the first referral. You just got to assume it. Right now that goes to building good rapport knowing about their family, knowing if they have nieces and nephews, that type of thing. You find that out in rapport, you can use that here. But if you skip through that part in rapport, didn't talk about their family at all, you're basically shooting in the dark at this point because you don't know where we're going. So you wanna make sure that in rapport, you talk about their family, right? And, and if you don't talk about their family, don't be surprised if you don't get any referrals because they don't trust you. That's the only reason they don't give you referrals here. There's two reasons. Either they don't trust you or you didn't, you didn't find enough information out about them. Right? But in the script, if you read those words off the exact way that I read it, you're going to get referrals in every home. Now, a little bit of a key to that is making it fun for them. They got to be excited about this. If they see a need for it, they know other people that need it too. But if you're just, oh, these are your child safety kits, this goes here, this goes here, you got to be excited, right? Sales is the transfer of belief. If you believe in this, they will believe in this. Does that make sense? So once you get that first person down, you're going to coach them up to get the other 10. Right, people, you gotta remember, people will generally give you half of what you ask for. So if you ask for 10, you could probably expect five. You ask for 20, they'll probably give you 10. Right? So when, when they give you the first one, you say, okay, John, yeah, you, let's start with your brother, John. You said he had two kids, right? Okay, we'll get two kids out to him. Um, now, does John have a 773 number or a 215 number, or whatever it is, you know? I would always ask that because it gets them started on the phone number. You're just assuming it, right? Once you get that first one down, you got to coach them up to get the rest though. All right, John, we're going to, we're going to take care of your brother. First, we'll make sure he's number one on the list there. You have nine other spots. Who else is next? Your cousin, Sally, we'll throw her at number two. You got two down, eight more left. Who else we got? Right. And the small psychology behind this, especially on Zoom, is when they're going through their phone, they're, and if they're on Zoom, they can still go through their phone. They can back out of Zoom and go into the contacts that will not close the Zoom meeting. So don't make sure they're not afraid of that. They can do that, right? But what I really want you guys to do is when they're giving you, you know, people, if they can still see you, just put your head down and act like you're writing. And don't look up at them until they stop. It's super awkward when you're, when I'm staring at you and I'm asking you for people and I'm just looking at you square in the face like this, because 
you got to think what's going on in their mind. I'm giving this guy his name and number. He's writing it down. And then he's looking at me to give him more. I just keep my head down and they just assume that there's going to be more given. Right? little small psychology behind that. So I even make it fun for them. You can do this. There's no rule against this. What I usually tell them is I say, hey, you know, we're actually having a contest this week at the office. And, um, you know, the people who get to protect the most kids with these child safety kits, the, 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 the state director is actually taking us out for lunch next week. So right now I'm in second place, right? You know, can you help me out, protect some more families with these child safety kits? Get me up to 10, that way I can win this contest. People will generally help you out. They generally will, especially if you build good rapport with them and they trust you. That'll get you a couple extra names. Small things like that, guys, have fun with them. Hey, we're running a contest here, you know, at the office and, you know, Whoever gets, you know, whoever helps out 30 families this week with these child safety kits uh, get, gets to have lunch for, from the state director. He's buying us lunch, to, you know, on, on Monday. You'll be surprised how many child safe referrals you get if you just use those words. All right. So that's basically it. All I got for the child safe. You guys have any other questions on child safe at all? No. Okay, good. All right. So the next benefit that they have set up for you, right, is the AIL Plus discount card. The next benefit they have set up for you is the AIL Plus discount card. First thing I tell them is that this is not insurance. This is not gonna replace your current health insurance. This is designed to work above and beyond your current coverage. What this does, this takes care of anything you pay out of pocket for at the dentist, the pharmacy, the optometrist, the dentist, the chiropractor, right? The next thing I do is I go to the next slide and I say, Mary and Joe, if, it, if this works, Jesus, what's going on here? Oh, my goodness. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so I say, Mary and Joe, you know, these are some of the benefits that, that this card helps you provide. And you can see that it works at the pharmacy, the chiropractor, prescription glasses. What I do, so I, I build up the importance of it. What it does is it takes care of anything you pay out of pocket for. Next thing I'm doing is a quick explanation on how it works and how it affects them. So the next question I ask is Mary and Joe, do you guys take any prescription medications? If they say no, I'm like, okay, great. In the back of my mind, I know they're pretty healthy. So I know that going through the underwriting should be pretty easy if they don't have any medical issues. We're on pace, right? If they're like, oh man, yeah, I take, I take a lot of prescriptions. You know, I'm at, the, I'm, at, I'm at the pharmacy every day. Well, at that point, you guys know that, you know, underwriting might be a little bit rough here. We might be dealing with a situation where I got to look into some medical, medical information. A big one to talk to them about right there is glasses, right? Especially if you wear glasses, like I wear glasses. Most of my members, most people wear glasses or contacts. At this point, I just ask them, now, Mary and Joe, do you guys wear contacts or glasses or anything like that? They're like, yeah, I wear glasses. Okay, great. Well, this can actually save you anywhere from 20 to 60% on your contacts and glasses. This card works, guys. You can sign up for this yourself too, and I recommend you signing up for this. Next thing I go over with them is chiropractic. You guys go to the chiropractor at all? Some people say yes, some people say no. I'm afraid of going to the chiropractor. I see some of those videos and I hear those cracks, and I'm like, no way, no way. Right. But some people do go to the chiropractor. You can see the chiropractic consultation is free. X-rays, scans and treatments are, are, you know, highly discounted. It also works with with Humana for dental. The diabetic supp supplies is a big thing that's on there. Hearing aids, lab testing, CT scans, MRIs, all that good stuff. So they just came out with the stats for this, too, about two months ago. 
and over about eight months of people using this, the average person saved about $300 over that year of using this. $300 they didn't have to put into something like that. They could put that right back into their family. Right? I, I, sometimes I'll ask them, what, what, would, what would an extra $300 do for you guys? And they're like, oh man, we'd, we'd be able to go do this, this, and this. Yeah. But what I really did is I just freed up $300 from their budget so that when I asked them, is that $100, $150 comfortable for you? They don't tell me no. Does that make sense? Now, the way the card actually works is it's not a physical card. It's not a physical, really a physical card anymore. It's actually an app on, on like a smartphone or the computer. So the reason that we, you know, redesigned it, and this just got redesigned in August of last year. So it's about a year old now. And it used to be called like the AIL partners card. And it was like a little pink card and, and the discounts were, you know, 10 to 20%. Now they're 10 to 85%, right? So they can download this app right then and there. Like anybody can download this app right now. It's free, doesn't cost any money. In order to actually access the app though, they need a username and a password that will be generated after we get done with the sit with them. So on the top of the needs analysis, there's a part that says AIL plus discount card and that's where you're going to put their information in. After we get done with the meeting, the company is going to send them an email in, seven, in about you know, 24 to 72 hours with their username and password attached to it. Drew, so all they got to do is use it to log in. I have a question, Drew, if that's right. Yeah, is it yeah the, what's up? Is it the, does it work the same way with the child safe kits too? What do you mean? Um, like how they get signed up for the AIL plus, you just put their info in the application. How does the child safe kits get sent out to them as well? Do we have to send them out or? Yep. We physically have to send them out in our, in our mail. Okay. And I, we, we have met the office here. So all you're, all you do is you'll include them in the package that you send them anyway. Okay. Yep. Great. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. The only thing that, that gets sent from our company to them is that AIL discount card email. So do we as agents have to, uh, or maybe not, do we as agents put together the folder and then submit that too? Or how does that all go about happening? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we have all the materials here at the office. Jay Vaughn will show you how it's done. Um, Perfect. And if you are virtual, um, we have a system, at least on our team, it's called Mail Me. Uh, anytime you get done with the sit, you just put their name, what kind of lead it was, and then what they need in their folder. And then you send that right over to our Mail Me. And we have our assistants take care of that. Sweet. All right. Now, when you're doing it virtual, um, we, we do have like a pay structure for it. So, uh, and, and, and I'll talk to you guys about that. It's not really for training. Um, but yeah, just know that there's a system in place to get that stuff sent out. Cool. So, you know, they, like I said, they can download the app right then and there, um, but they can't access it until they actually get the username and password attached to it. Okay. But the, the, the app is pretty cool. I have it myself. I would recommend you guys getting it. Um, you know, whoever's on my team, I'll show you how to do that. It's not, it's not too difficult. Um, now, when you do get access to it, it'll look like the kind of the middle phone, like the middle screen on the phone there. And um, it'll have like, um, like a map of all the areas that, or a map of all the providers that accept the card. It'll keep your prescriptions on there. It'll show you the discounts that you could get. It's a pretty cool app, you know. Um, I like it a lot better than the card we used to have, to be honest. So this is more intuitive now. Um, no one's really losing the card because it's on their phone and a lot more people are using it too, because they have access to it. So, um, after I get done and explaining it to them, you know, I, I ask them here now, Mary and Joe, do you have any questions on, you know, what it would help you cover or, or how it works or anything like that? And they'll usually tell me, no, you know, we're good. Okay. So. At that point, once again, you gotta, we gotta try to collect referrals here. You can just open your mouth and say words. Like really, if you're, if you're not asking them here about collecting referrals, then you're losing. This is one of the easier ones to do it on too, right? Cause we can tie this into union buying power. You guys know what union buying power is? All right, 
So union buying power is the more people that are involved in a program, the more providers will see that that program is getting traction and the higher discounts they'll get, right? So I tell, so if I want to collect referrals here, what I'll say is, is I'll say, Mary and Joe, you know, the, the way this card works is it works with union buying power. So what that means, Mary and Joe, is that the more people that are involved in this program, the more providers that they can access, and then the higher and bigger benefits that they can get down the road. So right now, you know, the company is allowing you to sponsor up to five people to receive their AIL discount card as well. So who do you know that maybe just retired? Or who do you know that doesn't have the best benefits at work? Who do you know that owns their own business? Those are great candidates for AIL discount cards. You basically just have to ask them who they know. Like you got to make it exclusive. Hey, you know, because this program is, is so new, you know, they're allowing you to sponsor up to five people to actually receive their discount cards as well. Right. If they gave you some referrals already, if they gave you two or three during the child safe, say, okay, now I'm going to start with the, the, the three people that you gave me um, with the child safety kits and make sure I get this out to them too. But you got a couple other spots on there. Who else did you want to make sure we got these cards, this discount card out to? Does that make sense, guys? Okay. Any other questions on the discount card? It's pretty simple. Nope. All right. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right. So the next benefit that they have set up for all of our families is what's called the family information guide. Now, this is where you as agents are going to gather the most information about your family that you're sitting down with. That's what you guys should use this for is to gather up the ammunition that you can use later in the presentation. Now, the reason we designed this is because if something happens, God forbid, Joe doesn't come home from work tomorrow, we don't want the family to flip through every piece of paper in the house to try to find this information. What this guide is designed to do is get your family from passing to the funeral. That quick three to five day process where there's a lot going on. Once again, the one thing we don't want you guys to do is to have to flip through every piece of paper in the house to try to find this information. All right. And I say, I'm just going to walk you through how it works here and answer any questions that you have about it. All right. So the first part there says vital statistics and historical data. That's just their personal information. So you're going to put your name, your address, your social, your birth date, all that good stuff on there. The second spot down is veterans information. I ask them, did you guys serve at all? They tell me no, keep it pushing. Okay, don't worry about that. If they say yes, thank them for their service, guys. <laughs> Sounds stupid for me to say that. And it sounds very redundant, but you'd be surprised how many agents I see in presentations and they're like, are you a veteran at all? And they're like, yeah, they're like, okay, great. And then they just go to the next one. Thank them for their service. It's two words, three words. Thank you for your service. Appreciate what you did for the, for the, for the, for the country. All right. Super simple. Spouse's information. If they have a spouse, have them put the spouse's information in there. If they don't, Tell them not to worry about it. The next section down though is also a very important section. It's the persons to be notified. So what I tell our members, I say, this is the persons to be notified section. This is where you would put down your emergency contacts in case something were to happen to you, right? So Mary, if something were to happen to you, I'm sure Joe would be your first emergency contact, right? She would say, yeah. Okay, now what if something happens to both you and Joe together? Who would you want to be next in line at that point? Like, oh, whew, probably my, my daughter, right? Okay, so you're going to put Joe here and then your daughter on the second line, right? And then there's a third spot that says person to be in charge of final arrangements, right? You can make that Joe, you can make that your daughter, you can make that a, a totally different person. But what that does is it stops family fighting. Having one person in charge of everything stops families from saying, 
Mary wanted this done. No, Mary wanted this done. No, she wanted this done, right? You got to remember at a funeral, guys, everybody is trying to do right by the deceased. Everybody. Now, whether or not they are doing right is a different story, but they all attempt to. So it's, it's important there. Why, why is it important? Because I, I, I want to know their beneficiaries. Because when I kill them off later, when I'm talking to them about dying, I know who I can direct the conversation to. For instance, if, if Joe has a brother and sister that he's naming on here, I would say, Joe, when you pass away, your brother, Mike, is going to take this to the funeral home. So I know their names, right? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of weaving my way into their family very, very slowly. So persons to be notified. You guys got that. Any questions on that first slide there? Cool. All right. Next one down is the last will and testament, right? You can also start the family information guide by asking them if they have a will or anything like that set up. Mary and Joe, do you guys have a will or anything like that set up? No. Okay. You're going to love this next benefit that they have set up for you. If they say yes, okay, great. This is going to work hand in hand with that will that you have designed. Because if they do have a will, they can mark that next section. It says, I have prepared my will. My attorney is, my executor is, the papers are on file at, right? I always tell my members, like, if you have a will, please mark that stuff down because you put hard earned money into that will. Let's just make sure that your people, your family can find it. What good is, is making a will if your family can't find it? Doesn't make sense. Might, might as well not even do it, right? Now, the next section down there, the estate information, this is by far the most important section on the whole family information guide, by far. This is where their life insurance goes. And I would tell them, I would say, Mary and Joe, this section, the estate information section, is by far the most important section on the whole guide. This is where you're going to put your life insurance, right? And I would say why it's important is because just alone last year, $1.7 billion of life insurance went unclaimed. And I would say, that's a lot of money, right? And they would say, yeah, that is a lot of money. And I ask them a question here because I want to get them involved. I would say, Mary and Joe, can you guess why all that money goes unclaimed every single year? And they're probably going to be like, uh, yeah, because the family didn't even know that they had it. They didn't tell their beneficiaries. That's 100% the reason why. People get life insurance policies. They forget that they have it. They never tell their family. Their family forgets that they have it. The policy goes unclaimed. People are putting hard earned money into life insurance. Let's just make sure it goes to the right people, right? So the question you're gonna ask here, and it's, it's one of the most important questions you ask in the whole presentation. And it has to be worded this way. The question you're going to ask here is, I'm gonna, I would say, this is where all your permanent life insurance goes. So Mary and Joe, do you have any permanent life insurance in force right now? Mary and Joe, do you have any permanent life insurance in force right now? There's three ways they can answer that. First way is yes. Second way, also, yes. Third way is no. This is the best answer you could get there, guys. Because they don't have anything permanent. Right? The first way they could answer it, yes. They might say, yes, I, I have permanent coverage. At that point, guys, you want to ask, okay, is that covers through work or outside of work? If they say, yes, it's through work. Just remind them, hey, remember how I told you before, you know, the reason that we're set up as a company is because, you know, most people have life insurance through work, but the concern is that once you quit, fire, retire, all those workplace benefits go away, right? So yes, they have coverage through work, but quit, fire, retire, it does go away, right? Now, if they do have coverage through work, 
they're going to put it on the bottom two lines where it says group coverage, hospital medical. So they're going to put the, pol the company they have it through, the policy number that they have, and then there's no spot for an amount you can see on those bottom two lines because once again, quit, fire, retire, those benefits do go away. But while you're working, while you're there, you should put that information down. Guys, if you asked 100 people who they have their life insurance through at work, 99 people would tell you they have no freaking clue. No clue. Because what happens is when they get benefits from a company, usually, they just take it right out of their check. They take 4 to $5 right out of their check every week, and they don't even see it. Right? So most people don't even know what type of coverage they have at work. Maybe one person out of 100 would know. So they answer that one, yes, I have coverage through work. Okay, great, I'm glad you have some work coverage. You're gonna put that under group coverage, hospital medical, and then there's no spot for an amount there because once again, quit, fire, retire, those workplace benefits go away, right? Now, if they say, yes, I have coverage outside work, I would say, okay, great. Who do you have it through, for example? And then they would tell me, I have it through State Farm. Okay, you're gonna put State Farm, the company number, and then the amount. So that all your family has to do is call one company, give them the policy number, and then they can issue the amount to your family very quickly. You guys need to know if they have life insurance through an outside company. You need to figure that out right here. If you do not, you're shooting yourself in the foot later down the road. And an easy way to get them to do that is, for example, who do you have your life insurance through? And then you'll tell them, I have it through State Farm, put the policy number, and then the amount on there. But why do I want to know that? I want to know that because I can use that against them down the road. Or I can use it to help them down the road. So I know that, you know, there's a company out there called Primerica. This is a very common one. You're going to get people that have Primerica. Primerica is a 100% term life insurance company. They do not do whole life. So if you sit down with someone, they're like, yep, I have Primerica. It's whole life. I know what I got. Either that agent lied to them or they have no clue what they got. <laughs> right? I've been in many sits where their people are like, ah, oh, I have Primerica. It's whole life, 100%. I'm like, I know for a fact it's not. So go grab your policy so I can show you that it's not. Right? Now, the only reason I know that is number one, I've been here for five and a half years. But number two, what I did when I was first starting out is I didn't know what life insurance companies sold which products. I had no clue. There's no way for us to bring a, a chart for you guys to have every company and what products they sell. It's impossible. So what I did, and I recommend this to every one of my agents, when we, when we have a sit, on the top, I have a notebook page for every sit that I sit in with. At the top of that page, I put all the information I know about them. And then at this point, if they tell me a company that I don't know or I've never heard of before, what I do is I write that company down and that's my homework for the night is to research the policies that that company has. All you got to do is Google that company, go to their website, and you can figure out what kind of policies they have. Super, super simple. Right? So I recommend doing that over and over and over until you know which companies typically have which products. Right? So if they have coverage, if they have yes, work. Okay, not permanent, right? Yes, outside. Okay, which company do you have it through, for example? Hey, Drew. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, just a question for you. So um, what you were talking about, like, you know, you could probably tell from what, what kind of insurance products or life insurance products a certain company sells. Are you Googling that before you meet with the client or are you doing that after? Usually after. Okay. Um, you can kind of do, you can do it in the presentation too, if you're quick enough with it. Right. You know, if you're building rapport with them and you're just like looking on your phone real quick. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of tough to do that in the middle of the sit. That's why I recommend like when you get done with that sit, if you get beat by that, 
look up that company so you don't get beat again. Uh, I see. Okay. Does that make sense? Right. I mean, some of the more common companies you can look up right now are MetLife, right. New York Life, you know, um, State Farm, um, Lincoln Heritage, um, like True Stage does one for seniors, you'll see. And then, uh, of course, the, um, the couple, the term policy, you know, um, there's, but there's like normally like eight or nine companies that most people go through. Um, and so you really won't have to do too much looking into it, but just know that if you get stumped by it one time, don't let it beat you the second time. Right. Does that make sense? Right. So would it be like, uh, wise to just Google whatever, you, you know, life insurance companies and just try to educate yourself on them a little bit? Yeah. It, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the worst thing. Yeah. You're, you're doing extra for sure. It's going to pay off. Yeah. 100%. Perfect. I mean, I can't tell you how many times guys, when I was a new agent, I would be at home at 11 o'clock at night looking through life insurance policies and, and different companies and just fall asleep with the phone in my hand because I was so tired of looking at things. It's happened, right? I'm just saying that that's where my knowledge base comes from is because I did the behind the scenes research and I looked into this stuff, right? So take a couple minutes out of your night and, and do that. Shouldn't take very long, Right? And so the other way that they can answer that is no. And that's the way we want them to answer it. They are probably not, you know, you might not get a lot of people that tell you no there. Right. But when they do tell you, no, you got to, got to make sure you're going for the kill there. You got to know that, Hey, they're not protected. It's my job to make sure that when they leave here, they are protected. That's what has to go in your brain. Does that make sense? Now, when they say, no, I don't have any permanent life insurance. I'm going to say, okay, now not if, but when you get some permanent coverage, because we all need it, right? Not if, but when you get some permanent coverage, because we all need it, right? You're going to put the company. So AIL, you're going to put the policy number and then the amount. See how I threw our company in there real quick, small little seed, right? So not if, but when you get some permanent coverage because we all need it, right? You're gonna put the company, so AIL, the policy number, and then the amount. That way your family knows exactly who you have coverage through, what the policy number is, and how much they're getting. Anybody have questions on the estate information there? Nope. All right, beautiful. Uh, the next section down, financial institution information, this is where their checking account comes into play. I don't want you guys to get to the end of the presentation, get all the way through filling out the application, get to the last part and go, now they just need your bank account information. And for them to go, I don't even have a bank. Oh, you just wasted 35 minutes with them. Your time is valuable guys, treat it as such. I'm not saying if they, if you get to this spot and they're like, no, I don't have a bank. I don't use a bank. I'm not saying, okay, we'll see you later. Close the laptop up and leave. What I'm saying is understand that they're not going to be able to qualify for it because they don't have a bank account. Does that make sense? So an easy question to ask them here, you would say, Mary and Joe, this is the financial institution information section. This is where you would put all your banking information. So do you guys have a checking account? And they would go, yeah, we have a checking account. Okay. So whoever you had, whoever you, you, you bank through. So I bank through PNC. I would write PNC, the account number and everything in there. So the reason why we want them to put that in there guys is number one, I want to see if they have a bank, <laughs> of course. And number two, a lot of people don't know this, but if you have money in a bank account and it goes untouched for five years, that becomes the bank's money. The bank takes that money. It's called a statute of limitations. I don't want that to happen to any of my families. So what I tell you is make sure you, your family knows where you have your accounts at so they can access that money. The bank doesn't need your money. They got enough of it. They'll gladly take it though. 
The next section down after that is a safe deposit box section. I kind of just skip this. These are kind of being, you know, phased out. There's not too many people with safe deposit boxes now. So you can tell them, hey, if you have a safe deposit box, put it down there. Um, there is a reason why this is on there. Um, I don't know if you guys know what a, a probate period is, right? But what a probate period is, is, is let's say someone dies and they have everything that they need in the safe deposit box at the bank. And their name is the only one that's on that safe deposit box. If there's a will in there, if there's life insurance paperwork in there, if there's investment opportunities in there, their family cannot access that for six to eight months. They basically tie that up. They lock it up. So if there's important things in there that your family needs when you pass away, make sure that someone else is on that safe deposit box and that they know it's available. But if they don't have one, just, okay, great. Don't worry about it. You know? Now, the bottom section there, the funeral service request section, is probably the second most important section on here. Number one reason why is because we're getting them to think about death. Number two reason why is a lot of people have unique ways to go out. I always tell them, this is exactly the words that I say to my members. I say, the last section down here, this is your funeral, funeral service request section. This is where you're going to mark down how you want to go out. Whether it's a burial, a mausoleum, cremation, just mark it down your way. That way, no one's going to fight about it. Right? And they even have a spot at the bottom for special instructions if you have anything unique you want done. Like if you want to be cremated and shot off into space, if you want to be mummified, uh, Viking funerals, right? There's thousands and thousands and thousands of different ways you can go out. Right? And then at the bottom, they can sign this and date it. And they can also get this notarized. Now, once they get this notarized, it will hold up as a legal document. But keep in mind, it's not designed to go through court proceedings. It's not a will. You're not leaving things to certain people on here. All you're doing is giving your, your family the information they need to get you from passing to the funeral. Does that make sense? All right. Any questions on how the family information guide works at all, guys? Now, they might ask you, hey, when I fill this out, who do I send this out to? You don't send it out to anyone. You keep it with you in your important paperwork drawers, right? Pretty simple there. All right, if we don't have any more questions on that, the next benefit that they have set up for you, if this is a union member, the next benefit that they have set up for you is your accidental death and dismemberment certificate, right? So your A, D, and D certificate. Let me pop that up on the board here. Boom. Well, that doesn't look like it at all. Looks like the will kit. Here we go. Oh, man, I gotta make it smaller. I don't know how to make it smaller. Well, it's all right. Here, minimize. There we go. All right, can you guys see that now? Is it good? Okay. <laughs> so this is what the A, D, and D certificate looks like. Each one of the union members has an A, D, and D certificate. Now, the values are different per union, and who's covered is different per union. But what's always going to be the same, and they're not the same numbers, don't get me wrong there, but what's always going to be the same, why is it doing that? Mark. Oh, I don't care if I'm not going to do it. What's always going to be the same is the SG number and the ID number. They're always going to, not, not the same numbers, but they're always going to be at the top right there. So the first thing I show them, the SG number and the ID number, those are the numbers that they're going to need to make a claim on this policy. The SG number attaches American income to the Teamsters Local 777. The ID number attaches Janine to the Teamsters Local 777. Right, so every single member in the 777 has the same SG number, but they have a different ID number. Does that make sense? All right, cool. Now, next thing I go over with them is I say, now, who is all covered with this policy? So, Janine, as long as you're a due-paying member, oh, why did it go blue like that? As long as you're an active and retired member in good standing, 
See how it says who is all who is covered? All active members and retired members in good standing. So as long as they're actively paying their union dues or they retired in good standing with their dues, this policy is going to be active for them. Right? And then I would say, Janine, this, excuse me, this policy is for the benefits for the accidental loss of your life, both hands, both feet, both eyes, one hand, one foot, one hand, one eye, one foot, one eye. If anything in that first category happens, $4,000 is going to come out to you if you're still alive, Janine. If you do die because of that accident, that money will go out to your brother, Justin. Does that make sense? And they would say, yes. Right. And I would say, now there's another category below that. If you lose one hand, one foot or sight of one eye, half that amount will come out to you. So $2,000. Now I understand that $2,000 is not a lot of money, but if you lose a hand or a foot, it could help you pay for prosthetics or something like that. Right. And then I ask them, do you have any questions on, on what it covers? And they'll say, no. Right. Then at the bottom, is the next thing I go over with them. And I would say at the bottom, I have to make sure I verify this information with you. Now, usually when we send everything out, why is this doing this? I don't know why I'm trying to mark this screen, but it won't let me do it. Here we go, boom. So everything from that black line up actually gets sent out to them in the mail. Everything from that black line down gets saved here at our office for records. So what I have to do is I have to verify the information on the bottom to make sure it's right. So I would go again, Jeanine, your address is 208 Lakeshore Lane in Bloomingdale, Illinois. Is that still correct? Yes, perfect, okay. And your date of birth, 5-14-1999. That's correct as well? Yes, perfect. And then you named your brother Justin as the main beneficiary. That's going to stay the same as well. Beautiful. Okay. Now you can see here, guys, that there's a phone number on here, right? That phone number, I asked them because chances are that that is Janine's phone number, not Justin's phone number. I need Justin's phone number on that line. So what I would say, I ask him, I say, Janine, is that your phone number there or is that Justin's phone number? And she would say, it's mine. I would say, okay, now, Janine, if something happens to you, are you going to be answering your phone? Probably not, right? You're dead. So we need Justin's phone number to make sure that we can contact him to get this money out. So what's the best contact number for Justin? Right, you're getting his phone number. Guess what, guys? That's a referral right there. That's a beneficiary. Once you verify all that in on there and it's good to go, Say, okay, great. You're going to get a copy of this out in the mail to you here in about a week or so. Now, Mary and Joe, or whoever you're sitting down with, I would say me, you, and Justin are really the only people that know about this policy. So what they have us do is make sure that we collect what's called a contingent beneficiary for the policy. So Janine, if something happens to Justin before you, or you and Justin in the same common accident, who would you want this money to go to then? Right? And at that point, what we do is in your notebook, you write their name, their number down, and the area they live in. And then on the back, on the bottom there, when we cut that out, you put their information on the bottom. So that on the front of it, it's the main beneficiary, on the back is the contingent beneficiary. You can collect two here. You can say what they suggest is that you have two contingent beneficiaries set up for this policy. So who would your two names be? Guess what, guys? Those are two referrals right there, too. Right? And then I'll ask them, do you have any questions on, on anything on the, on, the, on the AD&D certificate? And they'll go, no, we're good. Okay, great. Perfect, right? So do you guys have any questions on the AD and D, how to go over it, how to explain it to them? It's pretty simple. Just walk them through it. Nope, good. All right, beautiful. All right, so the, let me share. 
The last no cost benefit that you can go over with, the, with, with your members would be the will kit, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing here for a second. When the will kit gets sent out to them, there's, there's two parts of it. There is a workbook, which is blue. See, it says workbook right on the top of it. And then there is the documents, right? Blue is the kind of the rough draft of it. Green is the final copy of it, all right? So I have a PDF of, of the will kit that I walk them through. And I'll send that out to you guys as soon as we get done today. And I'm also gonna send you a video that's about 50 minutes long. It's actually the guy who created the will kit program. And he walks you through, number one, the long version of explaining it, and then a five, 10 minute version of explaining it. That's how I learned how to do this. So I'm gonna send that off to you guys so you can watch that. It's, it's great information, it, it is. It's, it's, I'm telling you, this will kit program is probably two years old now, maybe three, started when I was out in Philly. So we had no clue on how to go over this. But, but to be honest, these are great leads. These are great families. So what I walk them through is I walk them through kind of the workbook, not the actual documents, if that makes sense, All right? So the workbook, guys, it's designed for them to mess up, to fix, to change, replace. Once they get it finalized in here, they just transfer everything over to the green copy they get the green copy notarized and it holds up as a legal document, right? So the blue copy, I don't know if you guys can see here, but the first thing that's on the blue copy is a checklist. It shows them that they should do this, 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 and this, and then they can finalize it, right? So I tell them the first thing that's on your, your, your uh, workbook is gonna be a checklist. Make sure you knock all those things off the checklist before you finalize your will. Now, the second page and the third page, they're the exact same. So can you see that there? The exact same. Except on this side, it gives you an explanation on what you should put in the lines. And then on this side, it leaves you blank lines to put that information in. And that works the whole way through the workbook. Each of these pages is the same information, except one side is blank, and the other side gives you a description, right? So I'm gonna walk you guys through on your screen the actual, um, the, the will kit itself so you can see the spots for it, right? I'm gonna walk you through each of the articles, right? Now keep in mind when I'm presenting this to them, I'm doing it very quickly. This, this is probably the longest benefit that you're gonna talk about, maybe five to 10 minutes because they might have some questions, right? Just know the other no cost benefits, probably five minutes on each, maybe 10 minutes if you're collecting a lot of referrals, but they should be done. Boom, 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 right? You should spend 10 to 15 minutes on rapport, five minutes introducing the company, maybe five minutes every single one of the no cost benefits. By that point, you're in the presentation for 25 minutes, you've gone through all the no cost stuff, right? That, if you're gonna create a timeline, that should be your timeline. Does that make sense? So, with the actual will documents, right? Uh, I'm gonna move this camera over here so I can, you guys can see me a little bit better while I'm actually going through it. So with the will documents, the first part there, it says I, that's you're gonna put their name. They're gonna put their name, it's pretty easy. Article number one is the identification of their family. So it says, I am married to this person. We have kids with the, that are these people, right? The reason it has that in article number one is because down the road in the will, it refers back to my spouse as, or my kids as, right? So if they put the spouse's name in there, they know who they're referring to back in, 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 in the further parts of the will. Identifying their families in there. Article number two is a very important article. Article number two states that all of the debts of the estate are the responsibility of the executor. I'm gonna say that again. All the debts of the estate are the responsibility of the executor, right? So what that means is, let's just say for an example, Joe passed away and Joe, he had a $50,000 life insurance policy, right? And 
Joe also was $20,000 in debt. He owed the bank 10 grand. He owed money on his car, right? Let's say everything he owed was $20,000. So in his estate, when you pass away, if you don't leave things to people, it goes to your estate, right? So in his estate right now, he has a $50,000 life insurance policy, which is positive. And he has a $20,000 debt occurrence, which is negative. Now, if the executor of his estate, which maybe let's say is his brother, if his brother takes that 50,000 and distributes it to the family, gives it to people that need it, that brother is legally on the hook for that 20 grand now. That becomes the brother's debt. So what the brother has to do is use that 50,000 to pay off that $20,000 in debt and then distribute the remainder to the family. Does that make sense? That's how debt gets passed down from generation to generation because people don't know this stuff. They just think that, oh, he died. The debt's going to go into the grave with them. It's not how it works. It goes to your estate, right? Does anybody have questions on that at all? No? Okay. As long as you let them know that the executor of your will is responsible for all the debts in your estate, then you're good there. All right. Article number three is the disposition of property. This is what most people think about in a will, leaving certain things to certain people, right? Now, with the disposition of property, there's four different types of property you could leave to somebody. The first type of property is what's called a specific bequest. Now, a specific bequest is anything that you're leaving to an individual. On those lines, you can see, you know, it says whatever the article is, like the TV shall be distributed to my son, Sean, who resides in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They're going to name what article they want to leave, who they're going to look to, and where they reside at. They can do that for everything individualize, itemize, break it down for everything, right? In the actual workbook, I think there's only 11 spots where they can put stuff in, but in the will documents, you can see that there's 36. So if people have a lot of things to leave to somebody, they put that in there. I'm talking about like house, car, uh, photo albums, you know, jewelry, anything that has either a real world value or intrinsic value to your family. That's what you want to leave to people, right? Does everyone know what intrinsic value means? Yep, and it just means, all it really means is that your family member would value it more than a guy down the street. That's all it means. There's more value because it's your part of your family, all right? Now, the next article going down, whoop, this way, or then the next type of asset, sorry, the next type of asset to the second type of asset you can leave to somebody is what's called a digital asset. Now, these are becoming more popular. This is anything that's either costing you money online or making you money online. So we're looking at like Etsy shops, Shopify shops, Amazon accounts, Netflix accounts, Hulu, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, all that stuff. It's all got to be shut down when someone passes away. You got to think about this. How many people out there have bills that just get automatically subtracted from their account. A lot of people, right? Not number one, it's usually cheaper to pay that way, right? But in the same accord, Netflix does not know that you passed away, nor do they care. They're gonna pull that $15 a month out of your account every single month until you tell them to stop it, right? And if grandma, grandma had a Netflix account and no one knew that, they're just gonna keep pulling money out of her account. Right? If she had some money in there that was left for the family, guess what? It's smaller than what you thought it was going to be. So you can see right there, it says, my digital assets should be distributed in accordance with Schedule A. So Schedule A is on the last page here. Let me find it for you right here. So you see where it says Schedule A right here? Oh, let me draw on the screen so you guys can actually see it. 
Schedule A. All right. They're going to name the name of the digital asset. So it would be like Facebook, where to access it, facebook.com, the username and the password and what they want done with it. Shut it down, right? Or keep it active every, every year. So they can name all the websites that they visit. And I think there's about 25 spots that they can use as well for that. Let me make sure about that though. There's 19 spots they can use. So 19 different places they can use that. So schedule A is on the last page of the actual will. The, the third type of property you could leave to somebody is called a, it's called the remaining, remaining tangible personal property. So remaining tangible personal property is just a fancy word for saying house cleanup. Anything that's left over after you give everything away. Old clothing, dishes, plates, furniture, all the stuff that you're not leaving to somebody, that stuff still has to be cleaned up, has to still be taken out of the house, right? You're going to nominate one person to take care of all that. You put their name right on that line there. And it says, if the beneficiary does not survive me, the property will be distributed with my residuary estate. So nominate someone to take care of the, uh, the, the estate sale or you know, of the art sale that you're going to sell this stuff to. And then the last type of property is called residuary estate. So that's anything that's in, in a liquid form, like uh, 401ks, IRAs, investments, anything that basically you have left over that's in your estate, right? All those investments that you have. At that point, they basically get put into one big group and then they, you can split them up per person per percentage there. So you can see that there's like seven lines and you can split it up per percent there. Now, the one thing I'm gonna tell you here you got to let your members know, and it seems very stupid, but if they put people on here and it does not add up to 100%, the judge could throw this out because of incompetence. The judge could say, you don't know how to fill this out right. None of this makes sense. We're throwing it all out. Just because you missed it by 1%. So they have to make sure it adds up to 100%. Does that make sense? All right. So any questions on the types of property you could leave to somebody? No, nope. pretty good, okay. Um, article number four and article number five, nomination of independent representative and nomination of digital executor. The nomination of personal independent representative, that's gonna be the executor of this, right? So they're gonna nominate one primary executor and then they're gonna nominate a contingent executor as well on there. Same thing with the digital assets, nominate one person and then the contingent. These do not have to be different people. They can be the same people. They can be the same person that's gonna be the personal representative as a digital executor. They can be the same people. But if most families are like mine, right? There's people that are more responsible in the family and then there's people that are better at using technology. You know, for instance, in my family, if my mother or father were to pass away, I would probably be the one main executor because I'm probably the most responsible. But I know my brother is way better at technology than I am, way better at figuring all that stuff out. So he would probably be the digital executor at that point, right? But not every family situation is built like that. Everyone's different. Article number six is the nomination of guardian. This is a pretty important one as well. Now you might be meeting with a lot of like, keep in mind when you're meeting with will kits, there are a lot of older generation. They might not have kids of their own right now. They might, the kids might be out and, and grown, right? But if you're meeting with somebody and they, they, are, they have custody of somebody under the age of 18, if they pass away and they don't tell somebody who that kid is gonna go to and have it down in writing, then that kid goes into the system. At that point, if they want to fight and get that kid back, it's not immediate. He doesn't go in there for two days and come back out and go to the family. There's court proceedings. There's legal repercussion. There's stuff that that family has to do to get access to that kid back. And if, if this is the case, if, if Mary dies and she's 
you know, uh, she's the guardian of a 16 year old kid. The judge is not just going to give custody to her brother because he's her brother. That's not how it works. The judge doesn't know her brother from a guy down the street. He's not just going to give him custody. There's got to be legal paperwork involved with that. So this is a big thing here. You got to make sure that if they have kids under 18, that they nominate someone to take care of those kids. If they don't, don't even mention it. Just fly by it. Right? And then article number seven right after that is nomination of pet guardian. Pets are like our kids. You know, I recently just lost my dog. My dog just passed away about two weeks ago. I, I felt the worst. That was like my son. You know, and to be honest, if something were to happen to me, I would want to make sure someone took care of my dog because my dog was 12. He was old. And if I passed away and he went to the animal shelter, he ain't going to last long there. He ain't going to be there long. So I would rather have someone take care of him. And he would nominate the person to take care of them there. And they can even leave him money that every month to take care of him too. So just mention that to your members. They have cats. They have dogs that are part of their family too. Right? Anybody got questions on any of those articles? Beautiful. All right. Number Article number eight is the personal representative's powers, what they can do, what they have power to do. There's nothing to fill out on there. It's just, you know, what they legally can do. I tell my members, hey, number article number eight right there is just a little bit of legal jargon on what your, your, your executor can do. Take a few minutes and read through that before you nominate that executor. Simple. Article number nine is the digital executor's powers. Same exact thing as article number eight. A little bit of legal jargon, letting them know what, what the a digital executor has power to do. Right. Article number 10 is special directives. This is one of my favorite ones because this is where you're going to talk about what they want when they pass away. So Mary and Joe, article number 10 is what's going to go on after you pass away. So where you want to be buried at, whether you want to be cremated, you know, shot off into space. You can put your guest list on here. You could put um, people who don't want to be at the funeral on there. You can put what kind of clothing you want to wear. And what I also suggest that you put here, Mary and Joe, is if you have any permanent life insurance, that you put the company and then the policy number and the amount on there as well so that your family knows where to find that information. All right, so if you forget to ask if they had life insurance before, you can do it right here. It's another little spot to do it at, right? Or if you have something prepaid, this is a good way to find out if someone has a prepaid funeral. So if you have anything already prepaid for, like the grave site, or the stone or anything like that, you're gonna mark that down. I have a prepaid grave site and a prepaid head, uh, stone marker. So anything about how they're passing away goes in article number 10. Article number 11 is that just a, a few more miscellaneous provisions. Take a couple minutes, read through that. That's what I usually tell them. Take a few minutes, read through that legal jargon there. There we go. There we go. There we go. And then after that section, this is where they're going to get this notarized and sign this. So this page right here is where they're going to get number one, a notary to sign this, and then two witnesses as well. So there's three people that have to sign this. Now, now witnesses should not be family members. They should not be anybody in this will. Your friends, relatives, they should not be anybody in there. They should be a stranger. They should be your next door neighbor, your mailman. What I recommend for our members to do, and this is another way to figure out if they have a bank, what I ask them is I say, an easy way to get this notarized, Mary and Joe, is, is, is to take it to a bank. So who do you bank with? Like I, I bank with, um, you know, I bank with Chase. I'm like, okay, great. Well, it just turns out that we work with Chase. And Chase actually has a notary public on hand. So what you can do is you can head to your Chase branch and you can have them notarize it right there. And what they'll actually do is they'll grab two bank tellers or two people in line and have them be the witnesses. Number one, they're getting it notified, notarized, notarized for free. Number two, the witnesses are already there. Number three, I figured out what kind of bank they use, right? 
So anybody have que questions on notarizing it or, or where to go to get it notarized? They can also take it down to like their local, their local um, community branch center or something like that and get it notarized too. Or if they know a friend that's a notary public, they can do it there too. All right. Anybody got questions on that? Beautiful. You guys are easy. I love it. No questions. I love it. Um, all right. And then the next section over, this is a living will as well. So it's a, it's a final will and a living will. So you guys know the difference between the two? Yep. Okay. Just in case we don't, the a living will only is going to kick in if they are both mentally and physically incapacitated. They have an end state condition or a terminal condition. AKA they're not able to think and act for themselves, right? The will would actually kick in once they passed away. So the living will, they're still alive. The will kicks in when they die, right? Then now the living will part is pretty easy to explain as well. All they're gonna do is put their name at the top there. And then where it says life longing or life prolonging procedures, they'll initial there that says that I choose that if I am both mentally and physically incapacitated or have an end state condition or a terminal condition that this kicks in, right? Section B under that is the nutrition and hydration. If they wanna be on feeding tubes and, 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 and things like that, uh, they can or cannot receive artificially um, administered hydration and food. Uh, number C on there says that what happens if they're pregnant God forbid at that point, what they, what they will do. And then D down there is other requests. Like, you know, I want, you know, I don't want dran blood transfusions because of this, because of my religion, I can't do this. Right. Those are some kind of, kind of uh, like extra, extra incentives that, that, that the members can put in there. I mean, for, I mean, a good example is, is normally like, like I said, like based on my beliefs, I do not re wish to receive blood transfusions or something like that. Or, you know, I, I don't want to receive chemotherapy or, you know, whatever they don't want done, you know, kind of gives them a voice at that point. Um, and then the second part there, the second page over there, it says designation of healthcare surrogate. So they're going to nominate one person, one person to be the primary surrogate. And then at the bottom down there, it says first alternative surrogate second alternate surrogate. So they're actually going to nominate three people to take care of this. All right. And then in the section in the middle, it, it limits the decision making power of the surrogate. So like, like if, if they don't want to be, um, you know, or don't want to be on breathing systems or um, the, the agent is, is, is able to give me blood transfusions or, you know, if I'm at this stage in my life, just pull the plug, right? They can put everything on there. When you actually get the workbook, you'll see there's a lot of examples in it, okay? Then the next page after that is basically where they're gonna notarize this again, and then they're gonna have two witnesses sign it again, right then and there, all right? And then the last page, like I said, that's schedule A where all the websites are gonna go, all right? And then that's the end. So now at that point as well, once you get done explaining it to them, you're going to ask them, Mary and Joe. Now, I know we went over a lot of information there. Sorry, this camera's crooked. Uh, now, Mary and Joe, I know we went over a lot of information there, right? But do you have any other questions on the will kit at all? And they'll usually tell me no. And I say, okay, now the last thing you're going to do, once you finalize this into the green copy, you're going to make four copies of this, right? You're going to keep a copy with you at the house. You're going to keep a copy with your executor or executrice. You're going to keep a copy with your law team or attorney. And then you're going to keep a copy with your health care provider. I'll name them all again. Ready? One, you're going to keep at the house with you. Two, you're going to give to your executor or executrice. Three, you're going to give it to your lawyer or law team. And then four, you're going to give it to your healthcare provider. That way, multiple people have the same information. So if you, someone loses one, you know that there's backups, right? 
And each of those people that I named are very important in this process of the will, right? And once I, once I get that out to them, you know, once again, I ask them, guys, any questions on how the will works? Nope, we're good. Okay. So once again, guys, what I do, ask for referrals. Ask for referrals here. I'm telling you, the will kit is a great way to get referrals. People will just give you names. Because chances are, if their family is thinking about a will, they didn't just pull that thought from the sky. Someone else was talking to them about that. Someone at a barbecue or a family gathering was like, yeah, I just got my will designed. Oh, you did? Oh, I've been thinking about that. Right? At this point, just ask them. Say, Mary and Joe, I know you see some benefit in having the will designed or you wouldn't have applied for it. Um, you know, the company gives you a unique opportunity to sponsor five other people to get their will kit for free as well. Right? So who, who, who do you know that's been, been trying to design a will? Or do you know anybody that's been looking at a will? Just throwing it out there for them. Get some referrals from it, right? But that's basically the last no-cost benefit. The one after that, you know, after you get done with all the no-cost benefits, a transition from there is just right into life insurance. You know, it's, it's 2021, and most people we sit down with have life insurance in one form, shape, or way, right? After we get done explaining the life insurance, then we get into the, the needs analysis form, right? And that, that'll be further down in the train next week for you guys. Right. But um, I know I went over a lot of information for you guys today. Um, usually my my you'll get used to, to, to the way I, I, I teach you guys. It's more teaching than it is role playing. We don't really do any role playing in here. You're going to get enough of role playing in the morning with this. Right. You just need the information in the back end to make it more effective. You know, so remember, guys, when you're going over the no cost benefits, three things. Number one, make it important. Give them stats, give them numbers. Number two, explain it, include them in it, why it's, affect, why it's gonna affect them. And then number three, collect referrals, All right? So before I wrap up, I'll leave everybody a couple minutes to ask questions about anything. You guys have any questions for me at all? Yeah, uh, I did. So that was like quite a What's lot. What's up, Ryan? Um, not much, but that will kid stuff, that was like a whole bunch of information. So um, you said you'd be sending up a, over a video that we could go over a couple of times before we yep. have to. Everybody, okay. before you leave in the chat, put your email address. I'll do that right now. So that I can, um, and, then, and then during phone calls tonight, I'll find you know, five, 10 minutes and I'll send you all that stuff tonight. So don't worry, you'll, you'll, you will get it. It'll come with a video. And then it'll also have the PDF that I just went through with you as well. So you'll have all that stuff, okay? Cool. Good, good question. Thank you. Any other questions you got for me, anybody? Uh, you're good at explaining things. Autumn, what's up, Autumn? Oh, okay. So um, in the script, the after section about the will, it's like so small, like compared to all the, this information that we got. So why is it like, that section like really small when, but, but this is, just, it's just so much with the will. It's, it's, ma it's mainly because the will, the will kit program is like kind of a specific lead. You're not going to give the will to everybody. You know, you're only going to do it right. for the will kit program. Okay. So what I would recommend is watching that video over and over and giving them the quick 10 minute explanation on it. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Good, good question. Though. Good question. Anybody else got any questions? I see Ryan rifling through his notes. <laughs> uh, no, no one's got any other questions? All right, cool. Um, guys, today is phone day. Um, I know a lot of you guys are, are excited to get on the phones and start calling some people and setting some appointments. Let's, uh, this is where the weekend starts off, guys. I'm telling you, the best appointments are usually on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Most people are home, they're having, a, they had a good week, you know, at that point you're catching them at a good time. So just know tonight before you get on the phones, pump yourself up with some energy, get excited because these people are coming home from work, they're down. You got to bring your energy up to them, right? Hey, Mary, how you doing, Mary? This is Drew, right? Make sure you guys have energy, all right? But other than that, guys, um, I run training a class again for you next Wednesday, 
So if you guys are in the office, I'll see you here. If not, I'll see you on Wednesday. All right. Cool. Most important thing, guys, when you're in these sets with people, have fun. Seriously, that's underestimated. Have fun with these people. Get them to like you. Once you get them to like you, your job is so much easier. I'm telling you, it's so much easier. Just get them to like you, have some fun with them. Build common ground. Cool. All right, guys. I'm, I'm going to send that email over to you here very shortly, okay? Okay. Thanks, Drew. No problem, guys. Thanks. See you later.